Prose and Drama. This is an introduction lesson to Poetry, Prose and Drama. And of course, this is a double track learning center, G8 publication. How do I distinguish among poetry, prose and drama? Well, see if you can tell what each title is. Is it poetry, is it prose or is it drama? 1. Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening by Robert Frost 2. The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe 3. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou The other is Poetry What is uh, the purpose of poetry? Poetry is a form of writing that is meant to entertain, describe, inform, persuade. What are some of the text features of poetry? There are several features of poetry that makes it unique from other forms of writing. These are 1. Varied length written in lines and stanzas, uses sound devices, rhyme, alliteration, onomatopoeia, and others. Again, poetry also uses word pictures to create imageries in your mind. We will look at some of these imageries in our later lessons. 6. Poetry is usually intended be read aloud. What are the forms of poetry? Of course, poetry can take several forms. These include sonnet, romantic, epic, ode, ballads, lyrical poems, narrative poems, free verse, blank verse. There are many others, of course. The Sonnet. Let's now try to look at the Sonnet in detail. The Sonnet is a 14 line lyric poem. Lyric means the poem expresses a person's emotions as opposed to, say, telling a story. The Sonnet form developed in Italy in the Renaissance, where the poet Petriac used the form to write a famous series of poems what is love for Laura? Since Laura was married to someone else, Patriarch couldn't tell her he loved her, so he used the sonnets as a way to express his sacred feelings. Patriarch sonnets make elaborate and extravagant comparisons to describe Laura's beauty and his own despair at loving someone who could not pretend his love. And this is Patriarch. The Renaissance English poet Thomas Yatt introduced the sonnet form into English. So the sonnet, in other words, began in Italy and Yatt brought it to the English literature, both translating Patriarch's sonnet into English and composing sonnets of his own in a style similar to Patriarch's. So, Yat actually com uh, composed his own sonnets and also translated Patriarch's sonnets from Italian to English. In other, in other words, the sonnet was first written in Italian. Yat translated some of the works of Patriarch into English and composed his own sonnets as well. By Shakespeare's time, the style of Patriarchan love sonnets had become familiar enough for Shakespeare to parody or joke about. Indeed, Shakespeare actually made quite some jokes about the sonnet form Shakespeare wrote the most famous series of sonnets in English. 
but he and other Elizabethan poets modified the nature of the poem, changing the Italian form to make it easier to compose a sonnet in English. Later English poets have used the sonnets to write about whatever was on their minds, from religious experiences to political affairs, even though poetic styles have changed greatly since the Renaissance, the sonnet is still popular at the end of the 20th century, 500 years after it came into it, the, lang the English language. Now, there are two main types of sonnets in English, the Italian or Patriarchal form and the English or Shakespearean form. The difference starts in a rhyme scheme but affects the kind of thoughts expressed in the poem. The Italian sonnet is a two-part poem consisting of one eight-line part, which is called the octave, and one six-line part, which is called the sestet. The rhymes in the octave are closely linked in the pattern A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. For example, here is the octave of the sonnet John Milton wrote when he turned 23 in 1631. How soon had time the subtle thief of youth stolen on his wing my three and twentieth year. My hasting days fly on with fly on with full career, but my late spring no bad or blossom sure. Perhaps my semblance might deceive the truth. But I, to manhood, am arrived so near, and inward ripeness doth much less appear, that some more timely happy spirits endure. The rhyme scheme, as we can see, is A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. In other words, we have A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Later we shall come to know that some of these things may be described as chiasmus. Chiasmus. Write that somewhere and try to find it out. C-H-I-A-S-C-H-I-A-S-M-U-S. The entire octave is devoted to posing a problem. So, in the Patriarchan sonnet, the octave, which is the eighth line, actually brings out the problem that the poet wants to talk about. Milton here says he really hasn't accomplished much for his age, and despite his grown-up appearance, he isn't as mature as some other people. A timely happy spirit at the age of 23. Thus, this is how the octave in an Italian sonnet is supposed to work. The octave sets up a problem of some sort, which the cestic then resolves. This is Milton for you. So, the Patriarchal sonnet actually sets a problem or brings out the problem in the first eight lines, and this problem is supposed to be resolved in the sestet. Here is a sestet in Milton's birthday poem. Yet be it less or more, or soon or slow, it shall be still in strictest measure even. To that same lot, how ever mean or high, toward which time leads me, and the will of hell, all is, if I have grace to use it so, as ever in my great task, masters I. Here we have C, D, E, D, C, E, C, D, E, D, C, E. Milton solved the problem by concluding that being a left bloomer is no problem. The passage of time is not important to God, who controls Milton's destiny 
since all time is eternity to God, Milton's great taskmaster. The rhyme scheme in the sestet is not as strict as that in the octave and varies greatly from poem to poem. And Shakespeare modified the sonnet form to require fewer words with the same rhyme, but in doing so he also modified the kind of meaning or argument that the poem would convey. Shakespeare's rhyme scheme uses three groups of four lines or quatrains, and one concluding group of two lines or a couplet. In other words, it is easier to, to find words that rhyme in Italian language than it is to find same in the English language. So Shakespeare had to develop a system a bit different from that of the Patriarchan Sonnet. Now in doing this, he formed three groups of four lines. The four lines are what we are referring to as quatrains. So the Shakespearean Sonnet has three quatrains and at the end, after the three quatrains, we find one couplet, which is two line piece. Rather than posing a single problem and solving it, this organization by Shakespeare lends itself to a three-part argument and a conclusion, or maybe three illustrations of the same problem and a comment on the problem. That is, in Shakespeare's case, the first quatrain may talk about one problem, the second uh, quatrain may talk about another problem or argument, and then the third quatrain may also talk about another problem or argument, and then the couplet comes to make a comment on the problems as had been stated. Alternatively, the first quatrain may talk about one particular issue, illustrate a particular issue. The second quatrain will also illustrate the same situation or problem, but in a different way. Then the third quatrain will also uh, try to talk about the same problem or situation, but again in a different illustration. After these three illustrations, then the couplet comes to make a comment on the problem or situation that had been illustrated in the three quatrains. Here is the three illustration type. In Shakespeare's Sonnet 73 That time of year thou mayest in me behold when yellow leaves or none or few do hang upon those boughs which shake against the cold bare unique bare ruined choirs where late the sweet birds sang in me thou seest the twilight of such day as after sunset fadeth in the west which by and by slack black night doth take away Death's second self that seals up all in rest. In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie, as a dead bed whereon it must expire, consumed with that which it was nourished by. This thou perceivest, which makes thy love more strong to love that well which thou must leave ere long. A beautiful piece, of course. Observe the rhyme scheme. A, B, A, B. That is the first quatrain. C, D, C, D. The second quatrain. E, F, E, F. 
the third quatrain, then Gigi, the couplet. A, B, A, B, first quatrain, C, D, C, D, second quatrain, E, F, E, F, third quatrain, and then G, G. Now the A, B, A, B system is what some have called alternate, alternating rhymes. Maybe later in our lessons we will talk about some of these. Now Shakespeare gives three illustrations of what's bothering him. He feels cold and exhausted. He compares himself to the season of winter, to the twilight of the day, and to a dying fire that will be choked by the ashes of the wear of the wood that once fed it. So, the first illustration, that is, in the first quatrain, he compares himself to the season of winter. That is, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, when yellow leaves or none of you do hang that upon those boughs which shake against the cold, bear rimmed quass, where lit the sweet birds sang. Now, that time referred there is the time of winter, the season of winter, and he compares himself to that. Then, in the second quatrain, he compares himself to the twilight of the day. In me thou seest the twilight of such day, as after sunset faded in the west, which by and by black night doth take away, that second self that seems that seals up all in rest. Then in the third quatrain he compares himself to a dying fire that will be choked by the ashes of the wood that once fed it. So again he begins, In me thou seest the glowing of such fire that on the ashes of his youth doth lie as the deathbed whereon it must expire consumed with that which it was nourished by. So the same thing is illustrated in all the three quatrains. Rather than devoting a whole sestet to resolving his problem, Shakespeare has only two lines left to comment on his problem. He quickly notes that his friend loves him all the more because he sees Shakespeare will not be around forever. Let's have a look at it. This thou perceivest, this you see, this you recognize, which makes thy love, which makes your love more strong, to love that well which thou must live ere long. Thus, knowing these limitations in me, knowing the fact that this is my situation, makes you love me more, because you know that this is something or someone that soon you may have to leave. Now, most English sonnets use lines made up of five groups of syllables known as feet. The fourth commonly used is the I am. The I am. The I am, which consists of one weak syllable followed by one strong syllable. Since there are five I ams in a line, the meter is called iambic pentameter. We have already seen some good examples. To love that well which thou must live a long, or that I to man would am arrive so near. Let's take, let me take it again. To love that well with thou must live alone. 
that I to man would am arrive so near. Try taking it yourself and see. You will notice that there are ten, ten syllables. And each of these ten is made up of two syllables with one unstressed followed by one stressed syllable. That component is what we are referring to as an ayam. So, to love, that is, the unstressed is to, and the stressed is love. So, to love, that well, with thou, must leave, alone, that I, to mourn, who thou, arrived, so near. Try it yourself. It's a beautiful exercise. As we've seen, now let's look at the subject matter of the sonnet. As we've seen, the sonnet started out as a love poem, often portraying hopeless love for a lady who would never return the poet's love. There were conventional subjects such as elaborately cataloging the lady's beautiful traits or offering to immortalize the lady by writing poems about her, as we shall later perhaps see in Shakespeare's Sonnet 18, in which poem he tries to immortalize somebody. We don't know who this person is, but he tries to immortalize this person with his poem Sonnet 18. Look for that poem and enjoy it. After the Elizabethan age, sonnet writers began using the sonnet form for many subjects other than love poems. Well, now let's have a look at Romanticism and Romantic Poetry. Romanticism is a, is a name given to a dominant movement in literature and the other arts, particularly music and painting, in the period from the 1770s to the mid-19th century. The publication of lyrical ballads by William Wordsworth and Samuel Taylor Coleridge in 1792 is considered the beginning of literary romanticism. These are some of the romantic poets. We have William Blake, William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Lord Byron, Percy Bysshe Sheila, John Keats. These are all romantic poets. Now Shakespeare lived before these people. In other words, Shakespeare lived before the romantic era. But sometimes we look at some of his poems and we find some elements of romanticism. But technically speaking, Shakespeare is not a romantic poet. Yet, because of this, the elements of romanticism that are sometimes found in his poems, some are con some uh, con sometimes consider him to be one, but he's not. Characteristics of Romanticism and Romantic Poetry Romantic Characteristic Romantic Poetry usually shows interest in the common man and childhood. Romantics believed in the natural goodness of humans which is hindered by the urban life of civilization. They believe that the savage is noble, childhood is good, and the emotions inspired by other beliefs cause the heart to soar. Again, romantic poetry emphasizes strong senses, emotions, and feelings. Romantics believed that knowledge is gained through intuition rather than deduction. This is best summed up by Westwick, who stated that all, quote, all good poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings, unquote. 
the art of nature. Romantics stress the art of nature in art and language and the experience of sublimity through a connection with nature. Romantics rejected the rationalization of nature by the previous thinkers of the Enlightenment period. Indeed, the Romantics actually celebrated the individual. Romantics often elevated the achievements of the misunderstood heroic individual outcasts. Romantics also place importance on imagination. Romantics legitimized the individual imagination as a critical authority. They did not believe that you have to try to convince somebody to make sense. No, they believe that if you can imagine, you can say it. And that is romantic poetry for you. Later we shall see some other types, some other era, in which your poetry had to be an attempt to try to convince somebody. And we realize that romantic poetry is a completely different thing altogether. What's a couplet? A couplet is a two lines that rhyme. A complete idea is usually expressed in a couplet or in a long poem made up of many couplets. Couplets may be humorous or sometimes serious. An example, for example, But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. Friends rhymes with end. This is by Shakespeare. Chocolate candy is sweet and yummy. It goes down smoothly in my tummy. Yummy rhymes with tummy. It is not known the source of this piece. Let's look at another one quite popular. We hear it a lot. But we don't realize that we are dealing with couplets. Twinkling, twinkling, little star. How I wonder what you are. About the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Now, the first couplet twink is twinkling, twinkling little star. How I wonder what you are. In the first couplet, star rhymes with R. Star, R. In the second couplet, up above the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. High rhymes with sky, high, sky. Another type of poem is a narrative poem. Narrative poems actually tell a story. A narrative poem is a story told in verse by a speaker or a narrator. In a narrative poem, there's a plot. That is, something happens because of this, something else happens. And the sequence of events actually continue in that line. They may be true or pure fiction. Narrative poems vary in treatment of character and setting, like any, like any story. There are different forms of narrative poetry. In other words, we can have different kinds of poems that are actually narrative, meaning they actually tell stories. Typical examples include the ballad, and the epic, these are the two most popular examples, the ballad and the epic. They are all types of poems. Now let's look at the ballad as a narrative poem. The ballad is a narrative, is a narrative rhyming poem or song. Ballads are often sung because they, 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 they contain a lot of rhymes. They are characterized by short stanzas and simple words, usually telling a heroic and or tragic story, although some are actually humorous. Now, ballads can be quite long, and they often have a recurrent refrain. They are also usually rich with imagery, especially charged with, emo with emotional, emotionally visual images. Ballads actually originated from folk songs that told exciting or dramatic stories. Some cultures actually had songs that sang 
about heroes. They had songs that told stories about heroes. And it is from this, these traditions that the ballad actually developed into what it is now. Let's look at this example from John Henry. It is a traditional American ballad in 10 stanzas. We will only uh, look at just two stanzas. When John Henry was a tiny little baby sitting on his mother's knee, he picked up a hammer and a little piece of steel, saying, Hammer's going to be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer's going to be the death of me. John Henry was a man just six feet high, nearly two feet and a half across his chest. He had hammer with a nine-pound hammer all day. And if I get tired, he went to rest, Lord, Lord. And if I get tired, he went to rest. Now observe the refrain. Though they are different for each stanza, they follow the same pattern in one way or the other. I'm as going to be the death of me, Lord, Lord. I never get tired and want to rest, Lord, Lord. I'm as going to be the death of me. I never get tired and want to rest. You observe the repetition of the penultimate line that is the last but one line in each stanza. In the first stanza, I'm as going to be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Then we see the repetition. I'm as going to be the death of me. In the last stanza, in the second stanza, and never get tired and want to rest, Lord, Lord. And never get tired and want to rest. This is a beautiful song. I wish I could sing it for you to enjoy it. When John Henry was a little tiny baby, sitting on his mama's knee, he picked up a hammer and a little piece of steel, saying, Hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord, Lord. Hammer's gonna be the death of me. John Henry was a man just six feet high, nearly two feet and a half across his chest. He'd hammer with a nine and he would hammer with a nine pound hammer all day and never get tired and want to rest, Lord, Lord, and never get tired and want to rest. And when John Henry was a tiny little baby, Sitting on his mama's knee, he picked up a hammer and a little piece of steel, saying, Hammer's gonna be the death of me, Lord, Lord, Hammer's gonna be the death of me. John Henry was a man just six feet high, nearly two feet and a half across his chest. He'll hammer with a nine pound hammer all day and I get tired and want to rest, Lord, Lord, and I get tired and want to rest. That's a beautiful song, just a piece of the whole. Now let's continue with the ballad, an example from the Unquiet Grave, an old ballad that would have been sung at one eerily really a catchy tune. The wind that blow today, my love, and a few small drops of rain. I never had but one true love. In cold grave she was slain. I'll do as much for my true love as any young man may. I'll sit and moan all at her grave for twelve months and a day. Let's see. The wind up blow today, my love, and a few small drops of rain. I never had but one true love, in cold grave she was slain. I'll do a smile for my true love as any young man may. I'll sit and moan all at her grave for a twelve month and a day. 
Can you try singing it? Well, let's continue. Another type of narrative poem is the epic. The epic is a very long narrative, historic poem that tells of the adventures of a hero. The purpose is to help the reader understand the past and be inspired to choose good over evil. Usually, epics, the epic focuses on the heroism of one person who is a symbol of strength, virtue, and courage in the face of conflict. Some are very long. For example, The Odyssey by Homer, written as 12 books, has over 6,213 lines in the first half alone. We can talk of Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales, which has several tales put together. Now let's look at lyric poetry. Lyric poetry always expresses some emotion. They are usually shorter than epic poems. They tend to express the personal feelings of one speaker, often the poet. And they give you a feeling that they could be sung. This is why songs, we often talk about the lyrics of songs, because Songs that are sung, most of them are actually sung because they are lyrical, they are lyrical poems. Lyric poetry was originally Greek, uh, originally Greek poets sang or recited poems accompanied by music played on a lyra, which is a string instrument, like a small harp, this one is a lyra. This is a lyre. In the Renaissance, poems were accompanied by a lute, which was like a guitar, this one. Now the sonnet is also a lyrical poetry. Most sonnets are in a fixed form of 14 lines of 10 syllables, usually written in the iambic pentameter. We have discussed sonnets in detail already. The ode which is also a, liter a lyric poetry, is a tribute to someone or something, often uses exalted language in praise or celebration, and they can be serious or humorous. An example is the Ode to Pablo's Tennis Shoes by Gary Soto. In this poem, where well, we shall see the weight and the Pablo spared. What weights? Pablo's shoes, of course. His, ter his tennis shoes. The weight and the Pablo spared. Rain beaten, sun beaten, a scuff of green at their tips from when he fell in the schoolyard. He fell leaping for a football that sailed his way. But Pablo fell and got up, green on his shoes, with the football out of reach. Now it's night. Pablo is in bed listening to his mother laughing to the Mexican novelas on TV. The shoes, twin pets, that snuggle his toes, are under the bird. Obviously, this is not quite serious. It is simply about the little boy, little Pablo's tennis shoes. The elegy. The elegy is used to express grief or mourning for someone who has died. It is usually somber, serious, and ending on a peaceful note. Let's look at this long, uh, not so long, example of an elegy by Jessica Smith. Jessica actually writes this elegy in memory of Annie Frank. Annie Frank suffered and Jessica Smith wrote this elegy 
for her. Annie Frank was a little girl who had to be in hiding during the Holocaust. The Holocaust was the time when Hitler wanted to kill all Jews. And so Jews had to be in hiding. This little girl, about 12, 13 years old at the time, wrote this, wrote in his diary everything that happened. And this diary became very important later because it was the only direct source from somebody who suffered the, the Holocaust who tried to give account of everything that he went through within a space of about two years and the Sivas Smith writes, writes this elegy about this little girl you blossomed and grew between the quiet gray walls of your attic home a sidewalk surrounded flower pushed up through the cracks petals raining for the light, but your roots held you down. In the dim light of your room you made family trees, the continuing lives comforting you in ways your mother could not. While concentration comes, build bonfires with the bones of your neighbors. You dream of the sun and the love you would find when the doors of your prison were unlocked. When I took your short life from your diary, I could feel your heartbeat pulse with my own. And every breath you took went into my own lungs. Every desire you felt, I felt too. Your life was held by four silent years, surrounding you as the four walls did. And before the last bomb fell, destroying the last of your love and light, you died. And I am thankful. This is little Annie Frank, whose diary contains so much. Now, the limerick. Another type of poem, a limerick. It is a funny five line poem written with one couplet and one triplet. Always follows the same pattern. The rhyme scheme or pattern is A A B B A. The last line contains the punch line or heart of the joke. That is, after the joke has been told, after everything has been said, it is the last line that brings out the whole thing. If you miss the last line, you miss the entire stuff. Limericks often contain hyperbole, onomatopoeia, idioms, and other figurative language. You will soon hear the distinctive beat or pattern, beat pattern of all lim limericks. A fly and a flea in a flu were caught so what could they do said a fly let us flee that a fly said they flee so they flew through a floor in the flea observe the alliteration in fly flee flew observe also the rhymes in flu do flee flee flew can you identify the rhyme scheme? Sure, you can. Let's look at this limerick, an old one, quite an old one, of course, uh, by Edward Lear. He's actually the one who made limericks very popular. In this piece, he says, There was an old person of Dutton whose head was so small as a button. So, to make it look big, he purchased a wig and rapidly rushed about Dalton. B. 
before we even said grace, another example, we sat and filled up his face. He gorged on the salami, on salami, ate all the pastrami, then exploded with nari a trace. So, grace, face, trace, salami, pastrami. There was a large bear in a tree who was in pursuit of a bee. The bee was no dummy. He gave the bear money. So the bear let the honey be free. Tree be free. Dummy money. Now the free verse. The free verse is just that. Simply free. They are lines of poetry written without rules, no regular beats or rhyme. They are simply unrhymed poetry. Most African poet poems are actually free. They are, in other words, they are without rules, no regular beats or rhyme. They have no regular rhyme uh, scheme, no regular metrical pattern. We can find this a lot in African poetry. Langston Hughes also did some free verse in autumn thoughts. Flowers are happy in summer. In autumn they die and are blown away dry and withered. Their petals dance on the wind like little brown butterflies. No rhymes, no metrical pattern. Just free. That's the free verse. The blank verse. This is a verse of a poem with a rhymed iambic pentameter. An iambic pentameter is a line of verse with five metrical feet, each consisting of one short or unstressed syllable, followed by one long or unstressed syllable, as we have seen already. In other words, a blank verse is a verse or poem with a regular metrical pattern, which is iambic pentameter, but no identifiable rhyme. The haiku. The haiku is a Japanese form of poetry. One line of five syllables, one line of seven syllables, and a final line of five syllables, that is, five, seven, five. They are often fragments, not usually complete sentences. These, the lines, are usually fragments. And they are usually about everyday things, written in the present tense. And in, in haiku, we realize much is left unsaid. Look at this example. Little spiral child plays in the road. Go oh, watch out. Watch out. Horse tramps by. Soft summer twilight. Suddenly a sound. For glyphs in the old pond splash. And the first in the first stanza, look at it. Little sparrow child. How many syllables? Five. Little sparrow child. Second line. Place in the road. Go watch out. How many syllables? Seven place in the road go watch out then the the last line watch out horse tramps by five so the haiku is simply five seven five it's always a three line poem with five seven five that is five syllables in the first line seven syllables in the second line Five syllables in the last line. Look at the second example. Soft sa ma twilight. Five syllables. Sa den li a sound fro lips. Seven syllables. In the o pon splash. Five syllables. So here again, five seven five. So the haiku is simply the five seven five poem. Five seven five poem. It's a poem. Three lines. The first line consisting of five syllables. 
second line seven syllables and the third line five syllables observe the onomatopoeia in the image anyway now let's quickly look at, at prose what's the purpose of prose prose is a form of writing that is meant to inform entertain persuade describe what are the features there are several features of prose that make it unique from other forms of writing. These include written using paragraphs, contains dialogue. Sometimes, yes, sometimes they do contain dialogue, though they can be either fiction or non fiction. They can have headings and or subheadings. That is sometimes they can have chapters. They can be complemented by graphics, charts, such as charts, photos. What are some of the forms of prose? Prose can take several forms. These include biography, autobiography. The biography is a story of someone written by somebody else. The autobiography is a story of someone written by the person himself. The essay, novel, short story. You can have the novella, which is a short story, a short a short story, like the novel, but not voluminous enough. Novels are usually more voluminous compared to the novella. You can have the article. You can have the fable. Then you can have the folk tale. Now let's look at drama. What is the purpose of drama? Drama is a form of writing that is meant to inform, persuade, entertain, describe. What are some of the features of drama? There are several features of drama that make it unique from other forms of writing. These include stations, a list of characters, written, they are written to be performed written in the form of a script, that's the dialogue. They can include directions for costuming and physically setting a stage. What are some of the forms of drama? Drama can of course take several forms. These include play, can be a skit, which is rather shorter, can be an opera, can be a musical or a cantata where you have music. Uh, we, are, we are singing and trying to perform the songs at the same time. We can have a monologue where one person is having a conversation with himself or herself. We can have a mime where the person, somebody acts without talking, everything that he's trying to say. Is actually performed, acted instead of uh, the usual dialogue or talking. Then we can have a melodrama. Drama may also be comedy. They may be classified as comedy, tragedy, or in some cases, tragic comedy. In a comedy, a comedy. In a comedy, we will find a play that is that is for, that may contain um, some comic scenes, some scenes that make you laugh, and we always end on a happy note. So, in a comedy, we will find funny situations, comic situations, sometimes funny characters. And at the end, everything actually ends on a happy note. In a tragedy, we will find things, situations, that actually are not so happy. We may find death, we may find disasters, and they don't usually end on a happy note. Sometimes it may end 
in Shakespeare's case, invariably the, the land with death. Now in a tragic comedy we will find elements of both tragedy and comedy. We will find incidences of laughter as well as disaster, sometimes death. So the tragic comedy is a combination of both comedy and tragedy elements. Try looking for some books that are comedy, tragedy and tragic comedy. Shakespeare has books that are comedy, he has books that are tragedy, and of course he has books that are tragic comedy. Can you try looking out for some of Shakespeare's book that are comedy, those that are tragedy, and those that are tragic comedy? And of course, try also looking out for other books, other authors that are comedy, tragedy, and tragic comedy. Well, that brings us to the end of Unit 2. Now, you may have questions.